The World Beyond the Headlines lecture series is a collaborative project of the University of Chicago Center for International Studies and the International House Global Voices Program. Our nationally recognized programming is made possible with support from listeners like you. Secure the future of World Beyond the Headlines programming by making your gift online at alumniservices.uchicago.edu slash giving. Please specify World Beyond the Headlines as the area of giving. The World Beyond the Headlines lecture series is supported by the McCormick Foundation, the Norman Wade Harris Fund, and generous contributions from listeners like you. I'm Stephen Wilkinson. I'm chair of the Committee on uh, Southern Asian Studies, which is one of a large number of sponsors of tonight's event, the last World Beyond the Headlines uh, event of this quarter. Um, together with the Center for International Studies, uh, the South Asian Languages and Civilizations, the Committee on Southern Asian Studies, the Seminary Coop, the Center for Middle Eastern Studies, and I House, which has been kind enough to uh, host us. Um, there will be a download of uh, the talk as well as the question and answer uh, tonight if anybody wants to go back and uh, replay as well as see the other events that we've had uh, this quarter at cis.uchicago.edu, um, and that will be kept and archived there. Uh, after uh, Tarek speaks, uh, which, you know, about 40 minutes from now, people can queue up uh, by the microphone here and uh, we'll have a question and answer period. Uh, I ask uh, that people keep um, their questions as questions rather than uh, speeches. Uh, so without uh, further ado, uh, it's a very great pleasure to welcome uh, Tarek Ali uh, here today. Um, at the end of his book tour. He's well known to many of you. I can tell by the crowd he's well known to many of you, so I'm not going to spend a long time on the introduction. He's a public intellectual, an activist, a novelist who's been at the forefront of debates um, about foreign policy and uh, social justice and politics for uh, several decades, and we're really delighted to have him here. Uh, tonight to talk about his new book, The Duel, Pakistan on the Flight Path of American Power. Tariq. <clears throat> Good evening. Very glad to be here. And very glad to be here at this particular time in American politics because we are witnessing a regime change. And this regime change uh, has not been brought about via wars and occupations, but by elections. And the fact that the majority of the American electorate has defeated a wing of the elite that was engaged in wars and occupations and has elected a president who was committed to peace in Iraq, certainly, and a candidate who in the primaries came out very strongly against the war in Iraq. For such a person to be elected president of the United States, leaving aside all other aspects of his election, is, of course, a step forward. And I think one has to register that and mark that. It is an important development in American and naturally, as a result, in world politics. So what will this new president confront? Domestically, he confronts a severe economic crisis, uh, a crisis which, according to all the economists, including those who are partially responsible for creating it by backing what was being done for the last two decades, uh, requires firm measures and serious reforms. And it's not surprising that talk of the New Deal comes up, though I will point out that the New Deal happened largely because of the crisis, but partially also because at that time the United States possessed quite a strong labor movement. And the pressure of that labor movement was decisive in pushing, ultimately, FDR, President Roosevelt, in the direction of the reforms that he undertook. 
and which began to be dismantled over the last 30 years with tragic results. So serious thinking needs to happen on that front. But I want to concentrate today on discussing US foreign policy under the new administration. Three key issues confront the United States. One, of course, is the war in Iraq, a war which we all now know, it's not a big secret, was based on lying to the American people, to the United Nations, to the world, and a war which went badly wrong very early on, and a war and an occupation which has now cost the Iraqi people over a million dead. Over a million people have died in Iraq, two and a half million refugees. And just imagine, had this been done by a government that was non-Western and regarded as hostile to the interests of the West, its leaders would have been charged with war crimes, the prosecutors in the court of The Hague would have been preparing their cases, and the equivalents of Bush, Cheney, Rumsfeld, Tony Blair, uh, would have been charged with crimes. In fact, the former senior justice of the British High Court, a very senior law lord, very conservative law lord, Lord Justice Bingham said 48 hours ago, gave an interview or gave a speech in Britain in which he said that the war in Iraq was illegal. And that has created pandemonium because he's a very senior legal figure and people know what the consequences of that could be. He's encouraging lawyers to do something about it. So that <clears throat> Iraq war, I think, will be brought to an end. It won't be brought to an end cleanly, but I think there is no other way out, uh, and this is one thing to which Obama and the new administration, I mean, that is what he was committed to, so I think the procedure will start on ending that. There are two other problems. One which is, seems to have become intractable, though it shouldn't be. And that has been a continuing sore in the Middle East since the middle of the last century. And I refer to the situation in Israel-Palestine. Now, the latest Prime Minister of Israel to lose his job because of charges of corruption, Ehud Olmert, made a very interesting speech after he'd been fired. We can say he should have made it when he was prime minister, but he didn't. But the fact that he made it at all is of not without significance. Ehud Olmert said that we cannot carry on treating the Palestinians the way we are doing. We should pull back Israel and the settlers from the occupied lands. We should accept the division of Jerusalem and we should give the Palestinians a state. Now, what is interesting is that a senior leader and former Prime Minister of Israel can say this, pretty something which is so obvious, so obvious, he can say it, but not a single American politician senior politician or junior politician belonging to either party dares repeat it. That's the tragedy, that the Israelis are often far more critical of what they do themselves than is the United States establishment. And to question this is to be accused of every crime under the sun in the United States these days, if you question what's going on. And I'm tired of pointing out to my friends who work for the LA Times, the New York Times, the Washington Post, they say, you know, when you ask, why don't you report what is going on in Gaza every single day? Every single day. It's a ghetto under siege. And they say, we can't. So I said, okay, you can't. 
can't you just reprint what the Israeli, some very courageous Israeli journalists are writing about this in Israeli newspapers like Haaretz and Marif sometimes you see the writings of Israeli journalists really not taking any prisoners, just stating the truth. I said, can't you just reprint this occasionally so that the American public knows what's going on and say that this is taken from a Hebrew paper in Israel and translated into English by us? And they said, well, you know, you're right. This should be done. But uh, we don't do it. And in Europe, the situation is, of course, better because occasionally you will see very sharply critical pieces, but only occasionally. Even there, this big campaign, which was waged since the Second Intifada to stop any criticism of Israel is strong. And look, the reason I'm saying this uh, is not to score points. The reason I'm saying this is because the lack of knowledge of what is going on prevents the American people and American citizens from playing a full part in making their voices heard on this question. Because unless there is pressure from below, the politicians rarely act. And this pressure in the United States is virtually seized. And many, many people have no idea what's going on because it's not reported. So this is a serious problem which prevents peace because the United States is a major player in the Middle East and a very important donor and backer of the regime in Israel. If it, in, if it wished, it could bring friendly pressure to bear to do what Ehud Olmert, the former prime minister, is asking for. But they don't do it. And so the situation is bound to continue, as it is for some time, with more people dying, dying of starvation, more young Palestinians being killed by bullets, more suicide attacks on Israelis. It's a, it's, it's a vicious uh, circle, this, and it has to be stopped. But those who could stop it very quickly and rapidly don't do it. So this is, a, uh, this is a, a severe problem now that will confront the new administration. And on this question, there doesn't, there, I can't see any signs of hope that the new administration is, uh, is going to act. And certainly not if Hillary Clinton is appointed Secretary of State. The only U.S. administration in recent years to even wrap Israel on the knuckles was uh, George Bush Sr. and his Secretary of State. No one has done it since then. And it's needed more urgently now. So I say this because, you know, people get obsessed in this country with terrorism. Terrorism, it's a word now that has become very dominant in the political discourse. But you have to understand what the roots of it are. The American intelligence agencies know what the roots of it are full well. They've said that invading Iraq and occupying it has increased the flow of recruits to terrorist groups. Israel-Palestine is another recruiter of young people who despair and engage in these actions. So it has to be discussed and it has to be raised. And even if the new administration did nothing but make a debate possible, it would be a step forward. It really would be a step forward because there's a limit as to how long one can remain silent and people who don't remain silent and write books are under attack, marginalized, accused of all sorts of heinous crimes. I have a very dear friend, Ed, who's a historian, uh, Israeli friend, Jewish Israeli friend who's a historian at the UCLA has just written a book called The Returns of Zionism, which is a very scholarly and very sharp critique of that country. His name is Gabriel Peterberg. And he was telling me the other day, he said, the thing I hate the most is you make criticisms. And if you're a Jew yourself, they call you a you know, saying you're a self-hating Jew. So I said, well, I know they say this, but you know. 
one carries on. And he said, yeah, no, but I just wanted you to know that I've now devised a reply to this, that when some idiots at the back after I've given a lecture get up and say you're a self-hating Jew, I say, no, I'm very fond of myself, but I hate you. <laughs> which is a good one. We can't do it because we're called anti-Semites when you make any criticism, which is equally absurd uh, and ridiculous, but that's the world we live in, so we deal with it uh, as it comes. But I say that this is a crucially important issue. Until this issue is, is sorted out and some solution is found, there will be no peace in the Middle East fact of uh, life. Now, we come to the third area about which I've written a book, and this is Afghanistan and Pakistan. And this is the third war uh, which is going on. And this was, of course, regarded as the good war upon which everyone could agree, but it's a war that has now gone badly wrong. You just have to read the intelligence reports coming in from there and occasionally being published when head of security agencies report to parliament or report to the Senate or the House. And the, the, the view is that it's a, an extremely serious crisis now in Afghanistan. And because the situation in Afghanistan is bad, there is a temptation to say that the reason the situation in Afghanistan is bad is the fault of Pakistan, which provides a scapegoat, so a way out is to expand the war into Pakistan. And tragically, I think this was a big, big mistake by Senator Obama during the election campaign and his debates with McCain, when aware that he had put himself out a bit, you know, sort of by opposing the war in Iraq, uh, he went over the top in discussing the war in Afghanistan and said what we need is to send more troops, we need a surge in Afghanistan, and uh, if necessary we need to uh, expand the war into Pakistan to get Al-Qaeda. Well, you know, this is a co very confused statement because the war in Afghanistan today waged against the NATO armies is not being waged by Al-Qaeda. It is being waged by what British intelligence and the British foreign experts in the Foreign Office refer to as the Neo-Taliban. And why they call it the Neo-Taliban is because they say that there's been a big shift and a change and that many, many people who had no truck with the old Taliban are now involved in the insurgency against us because of what is happening in the country, because of the large killing of civilians, and because the country socially and economically is a total mess and the war is going extremely bad. And so one hopes that some of the advisors Senator Obama has appointed will make it clear to him that the situation in Afghanistan is bad and blaming a neighboring country for it isn't going to solve the problem. The solution lies inside Afghanistan not in, in Pakistan. And if the war is expanded into Pakistan, the subtitle of my book is Pakistan on the Flight Path of American Power. I mean, I never thought it would be literally true. I meant it more metaphorically, but it's become literally true. Yesterday there was a strike in a city outside even the war zones in Bannu, where they destroyed two or three homes. We haven't yet had full casualty reports from uh, uh, th th that. But what the effect of this is going to be, if it carries on, is it's going to destabilize the Pakistani military. Have no doubt about that. And if the unity of the Pakistani top, military tops, is broken, and young officers come to the fore, which has never happened in that country, unlike in the Middle East or Latin America, then there's trouble lies ahead. You will have a civil war situation in that country. So it is best not to go down that route. And I think that is the advice the new president will be given because some of the people who he's appointed are certainly aware that that is the case. And his allies may even start telling him this. The British, who normally are unquestioning 
as far as the United States demands are concerned. Uh, they just do what they are told, are now beginning to raise a number of serious questions on the war in Afghanistan. I give you two examples. The British ambassador to Afghanistan, the man on the spot, Sir Sherrod Cooper calls, recently, in a leaked memo to his French counterpart, stated that the notion that more troops are going to sort out the problems in Afghanistan is deeply misguided because we have already lost this war. And sending more troops is going to make matters worse, not better. Now, he was very embarrassed when this was leaked, but not a single party denied it or said it's a misquote. It, it just went on to the record. Then you had another statement by the chief of British defense staff with a rather eccentric name, Sir Jock Stirrup. <laughs> but Sir Jock Stirrup said that the United States is asking us to send the troops who are about to withdraw from Basra into Afghanistan. I am not convinced by this for a British, senior British military officer to even talk like this in public is unheard of. The last time they did it was during the Iraq war when they were not in favor of it. But for them to do it now in relation to Afghanistan is astonishing. We know that the Spanish government is seriously considering withdrawing all its troops from Afghanistan. The Norwegian military and foreign office elite is engaged in discussions. The Germans, whatever they may say in public, are deeply unhappy about this conflict. The French public, 70% of it is opposed to the French presence in Afghanistan. So I don't think that these countries are going to buy a long, drawn-out war in Afghanistan. In order to even stabilize the situation for a year, and I mean it's the stability of the graveyard, I think they would require at least 200,000 more troops and they would need to kill about half a million Afghans, Pashtuns. Now, if they, they do that, I say this very cold-bloodedly, I mean that's what it would require to calm things down, possibly for six months or a year. Or maybe not. Maybe that wouldn't, even that wouldn't work, but that is the scale on which they'd have to do it. But there is no way they would get away with that. And even this puppet leader in Kabul, Hamid Karzai, talks nonstop, pleading with the United States, please don't kill too many civilians, because it's making my job very difficult. And so the neo-Taliban, to come back to that for a minute, is partially a reflection of Pashtun nationalism. Recently, the BBC's, one of their senior most correspondent who knows the region well, Owen Bennett Jones, sent a report from Peshawar, and he said, I'm talking to some Pashtun people. They're wearing suits. None of them have got beards. They've you know, got short hair. That when I last discussed with them in this very place four years ago, they were half sympathetic to what we were trying to do in Afghanistan and now listen to them. And the rage and anger of these people because of the civilian deaths and casualties, and they said, we've now given up on the West. We don't believe it. We don't trust it. We don't care who defeats them. They've got to get out of here. So that there is now an extremely angry <clears throat> mood in the region. What is the way out? There is a way out, but it requires thought and it requires serious negotiations. For the last six months, both the United States and Britain have been negotiating secretly with the neo-Taliban leadership. These discussions are going on, pleading with them to join the coalition government of Hamid Karzai, pleading with them. And the Taliban, the neo-Taliban reply, we cannot join any coalition government as long as there are foreign troops present on our soil. Once you go, we will join and do whatever needs to be done. This is not a big secret. Barnett Rubin, uh, you know, 
sort of one of the people around uh, uh, Barack Obama knows all this is going on and uh, you know discusses it quite openly so they are engaged in these negotiations and discussions the question is this in order to return Afghanistan to some form of stability by the way this is a country that has now been at war for nearly 30 years longer than the First World War, longer than the Second World War, longer than the U.S. war in Vietnam. You know, they've been at war more or less continuously apart from a tiny gap uh, since the Russians went in in 1979, December 1979. Some of us argued at that time, myself uh, included quite sharply when the Russians went in. I remember writing a, a piece for the papers at the time saying we are now going to have this region totally wrecked for the next decades. And I wish I was wrong, but that's exactly what happened. Whereas some colleagues who are now very supportive of the United States, like my old friend Ahmed Rashid, were at that time diehard supporters of the Soviet intervention in <laughs> Afghanistan, saying that this was going to transform the face of the country forever. How can it? Look, there's one very simple fact people have to understand about Afghans. They don't like being occupied. <laughs> Think about it. It shouldn't be such a big mystery. Most people don't like being occupied. The United States would hate it if it were occupied. Never has been. But most people don't like it. And they didn't like it when the British did it in the 19th century. They hated it when the Russians did it in the last century. And they hate it that NATO has done it in this century. So then the question comes up, which I'm often accused of underplaying or underestimating. Uh, but I don't underestimate it. I'm quite realistic about it, which is, what about Al-Qaeda? That's why we went in. But this is true. But, you know, the minute or the, when the United States announced that uh, its aim was to capture Osama bin Laden dead or alive, well, naturally the guy didn't hang around waiting for them to come in. <laughs> he fled. Together with his gang, they fled to tribal areas we assume inside Pakistan. They weren't going to wait. But we don't even know now whether he's dead or alive. I know he plays a very big part in the American imagination, as if one guy could be, you know, is responsible for all this. But he may be dead. I mean, the fact is that till now he's intervened in every American election, sent out a friendly video advising the American citizens how they should vote. This time he didn't do it. And I assume that one reason he didn't do it is that he might be dead. Uh, <clears throat> in which case, uh, you know, I mean, this long thing about capturing him will come to an end. I hope. Unless you go in search of ghosts. Because it's, uh, it's, it's crazy to elevate this group, which is two or three thousand strong, into, you know, a big bogey. There have been terrorist groups in the past, for God's sake. It's not that the history of Europe and North America hasn't known groups like that. And they've always been dealt with, essentially, politically. And it's very interesting. The head of British intelligence, very, you know, conservative lady called Dame Stella Remington, on whom, by the way, the Judy Dench character in the James Bond movies is based. She recently gave an interview to The Guardian, and she said, I have now, she tells us, but better late than never, I have never liked the phrase war on terror. Because she said, we know what it is to fight acts of terror, because Britain was heavily under attack by the Irish, and you don't do it by waging wars. Now, when some of us said this after 9-11, all hell descended on us. But, you know, now it's virtually official policy amongst parts of the intelligence establishment. They say it. So the question is, all the al-Qaeda leaders who've been arrested have been arrested by police action, usually helped by the Pakistani intelligence. That's how they've been captured. The war hasn't brought any of them 
uh, 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 to prison. So it's it's not worked on that front. It's actually given them more more kudos. But in my opinion, they don't represent a major problem. The notion that 2,000 people can challenge the United States or any other country is a joke. They have the capacity to make mischief, yeah, but then so do other people. I mean, what effect did Al-Qaeda have? I mean, they bombed Wall Street and killed a lot of innocent people. You can't blame them for the economic crisis. I mean, the causes of that are very different, as we know. So I think to, 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 to go to war on the basis that we got to capture these people is false. They'd be much easier to capture if the war came to an end, in fact, because support for them would totally go, go down and decline because the Pashtuns are not that way inclined normally. Uh, I, I explain in my book what the real history of this region is. I mean, during the British period, the Pashtuns produced one of the largest nonviolent movements in the country. In that region, their leaders, uh, nationalist leaders, taught them how to fight without weapons, and they did it. So it's not the case, you know, one mustn't go in for stereotypes. This is what the Pashtuns are like, and this is what they do, and the only way they understand is by killing lots of them. Not the way. Not the way forward. Then there's Pakistan. This country is in a bad way. It is not in a bad way because of the common image of Pakistan, which you see in this country. I mean, the, the image can be summarized as follows. Groups of bearded jihadi terrorists on the verge of capturing the Pakistani nuclear facility. That's the image. Total rubbish. And I'll tell you why. Because there are groups of bearded jihadi terrorists, but they are relatively small. The nuclear facility in Pakistan is the most heavily defended facility in the country and defended by an army which is half a million strong. The notion that any group, small group, could capture that nuclear facility is nonsense. It's like saying some group of crazed Israeli settlers in the West Bank could capture Israel's nuclear facility. That's a real danger. It isn't. Or saying that some group of Hindu fundamentalists could capture India's nuclear facility. Well, they are stronger than their counterparts in Pakistan and their parties have even been in power, but that is not what they are, they're, they're capable of doing. Or to find a U.S. equivalent to say that Sarah Palin and some of her friends could capture the U.S. nuclear facility. <laughs> it's not going to happen any more than it's going to happen in Pakistan. So what is the real problem confronting that country if one is totally straightforward and honest about it? Is that we have a corrupt and callous and unfeeling elite that has done nothing for its people over the last 60 years, that has worked closely for most of its existence with the United States, especially the military section of this elite, and which has now brought the country virtually to a situation where there's a big, big crisis and an economic mess. I mean, the figures I give are the figures from the UN Development Report, 60% of the children being born in Pakistan over the last 10 years are born moderately or severely stunted. What has this got to do with religion? It's a big social economic problem of malnutrition, that people who spend fortune, billions on building up the army are incapable of feeding their own people. Or the fact that the country is without an education system and desperately needs it. People talk, about, people talk about the religious schools and madrasas, and they are a problem. But unless you have an alternative education system, you can't deal with that problem. Because if a cleric, a mullah, goes to a poor family with six kids to feed, or seven kids, and says, give me a son, and I will take care of him for six or seven years, clothe him, feed him, and educate him, the guys say, okay, take him. I mean, that's one less mouth to feed, and they hope the person, the kid, will be educated. 
Uh, it's sad that this happens, but the reason it happens is there isn't an education system in the country, apart from for the children of the elite who get a very good education, or for the upper middle classes, then these people basically live in a bubble. So that is the, the real problems that confront Pakistan, and the fact that none of its leaders, military or civilian, have been capable of modernizing the country even to a limited extent. That is the problem. That is the reason why there are more Pakistani doctors in the United States than in Pakistan. You know, doing great work, I'm sure. Uh, uh, but where they are needed is in Pakistan, and the reason they leave is there's no work. Because there are a few hospitals, and these hospitals are essentially hospitals for the elite. If someone were to go and make a documentary about Mayo Hospital in Lahore, which is a hospital for ordinary people, the conditions there are just miserable and appalling. So even poor people who are ill say, no, don't take us there because we'll die if we go there. So that is the extent of the problem that confronts Pakistan, which is a country of 200 million people. And so far, we haven't had any uh, 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 political leader over the last, you know, ever, who's been capable of dealing with this problem and sorting it out. And what we have today is a real mess. We get rid of General Musharraf, or the mass movement defending the, the judiciary gets rid of General Musharraf, and he's replaced by a politician or a businessman called Asif Zardari. And the only reason this guy is in power is because he's Benazir Bhutto's widower. And in her will, after her tragic assassination, she said that she bequeathed the party, the party, to her son until the son came of age to her husband. You can't say that Pakistani politicians aren't original. <laughs> I mean, I don't know of any other instance where this has happened. I mean, even if you go back to the medieval period, where, you know, to, let's go to Europe. I mean, the example I like giving is Mary, Queen of Scots, before she was executed, sent her son to her cousins in the French ruling elite. But even she said, I said, I she said to the French king, I entrust my son to your care. How he will turn out, I cannot judge. That is for you to determine. Asking for no favors, but saying, just keep him alive. But in the 21st century, we have a Pakistani politician leaving her political party to her family, as if it were a trinket from Tiffany's, <laughs> or a piece of land. I mean, it's just depressing, and the people in Pakistan are depressed. And you know, the, the, the elite is so incapable of, under, of understanding what it is and what it does, just six months ago, I was telling a Pakistani friend after visiting the country, I said, you know, the situation is really bad, and there might be an explosion, there might be an explosion which will take us all by surprise, because I said Pakistan really reminds me of what France must have been like in accounts one has read before 1789 and the French Revolution happened. There's no food, people are starving. People are sometimes cooking grass instead of wheat to eat something. And, at the same, and this friend of mine said, oh God, it's funny you should mention the French Revolution, because the other day there was a wedding in Lahore by an elite family, and he said, you're not going to believe this, but they took over a large area, erected tents, but the theme inside the wedding, uh, what they constructed was the Palace of Versailles. I said, this is truly surreal. What on earth do they even... They said, no, that's what they consulted. And food was flown in from Paris and Dubai and stuff. I mean, what can one do? You know, you do feel that only a revolution will deal with these people, really. I mean, no one else has been capable of doing it. So, in this situation, to concentrate solely on the security aspects of Pakistan is foolish. 
because the two are not unrelated. And you have an army now which is under heavy pressure to do the bidding of the United States as it always has been in that region. But if it is pushed too much, it could crack. And if that cracks, then all bets are off. Any, anything uh, uh, could happen. And this, I think, is a serious problem which is confronting the country. And I hope to God that President Obama's new advisors apprise him of this and say, look, it's a really serious situation. If you want to be helpful, uh, it's not on the military front that you should be pressuring these people. There are many, many other things uh, uh, to be done because the relationship of the United States with this country has not been good. It hasn't been particularly good for the United States either because it was these links that have produced most of these people <coughs> who are on the most wanted lists of the FBI for terror. But most of these people were working uh, during the jihad against the Soviet Union. So that, I, I think, is what needs to be tended to. And, you know, there is a new deal which the world would like. And the new deal would be to pull out occupying armies from countries that are occupied, put pressure to give the Palestinians some semblance of dignity, and then concentrate on rebuilding your own country, which certainly requires that rebuilding after the economic crisis and numerous other things that have been happening here for the last 20 years. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Tarek. Uh, your description of uh, Pakistani politics bears a great resemblance to the city of Chicago. Um, <laughs> where parents do pass on the party to their children. So, uh, I, I, I would hope also that we would see a withdrawal of all occupation forces. But the more I, the more we think about analogies with Vietnam, and, and they, to some degree, they're true with the wars in the Middle East. In some degrees, they're not. But the one thing, you, when you do look at some of the statements of Senator Obama and others, is that there is a eerie resemblance to what Nixon did with Cambodia and the wars in Laos, and that there's a certain logic to these wars that in order to not be seen as defeated, which of course that's what McNamara and others all said when the Vietnam War started, that we cannot be seen as defeated, um, it bears a strong resemblance to what's going on now. And I was just wondering if you could say something about the current war in Vietnam and similarities and differences with them. Well, I you know, really don't think that, apart from the Cambodia uh, reference, which I think you know, was an act of desperation by Nixon and Kissinger uh, to, to, to stave off uh, the defeat in Vietnam, there are no other real analogies. I mean, the Vietnam War was fought by the United States, not with a conscript army, but by an army uh, which was drafted, that every single American citizen could be drafted to fight the war. And that, curiously, uh, democratized the war that every single family in the United States was affected by it and every family had to think about it. Even those who supported the war had to think about it and from virtually every social layer in the country because their kids could be drafted in. And curiously enough, the impact of that was that the United States citizens were far more engaged with that conflict than they have been with the conflict in the Middle East or Afghanistan where the apart from a sudden rise of an anti-war movement to try and stop the war from happening, it then more or less went under. And the main work was done by military families or people who'd lost kids. I mean, Cindy Sheehan's sort of incredibly strong, powerful, symbolic action. So that was one thing. The other thing is that the people who were fighting the United States in Vietnam were not of a religious temperament. They were communists. Uh, shared in some ways with the United States a common descent from the Enlightenment and the philosophers of the Enlightenment. You know, however varied and different they were in many other aspects. And so that 
did create, uh, it created a different feeling in the world. Uh, that is not the case either in Iraq or in Afghanistan, which affects the way that people think. And the Vietnamese were extremely clever in constantly bearing in mind that when they were talking publicly, they were talking not just to American diplomats, but to citizens in the United States. And that had its uh, impact. But leaving all that aside, I think that the war in Iraq is they realize that that war is lost, and so it's a question of working out. And they're at the moment discussing with the people they put in power various mechanisms, face-saving devices. But the fact of the matter is that the occupation <clears throat> of Iraq and the toppling of the Saddam Hussein regime uh, opened up a big vacuum in the Middle East and made Iran the strongest player in the region. That has been the impact of the U.S. occupation of Iran, that Iran now emerges as the strongest regional uh, uh, player with which they'll have to deal. I think the new government will have to deal with them. Um, and uh, so we shall, we shall see. I think they will pull out and expect Iran to keep Iraq stable, which means that relations between the United States and Iran will have to cool down considerably and probably are, even, even as we speak. Yeah. I'm going to ask uh, two questions, if that's all right. You're not obligated to answer either, but I'd like Could to you get you to answer up? both. Yeah. Um, my, I have two questions. Yeah. Um, the first one is Joe Biden uh, wrote an article on Pakistan in uh, November 2007 where he advocated a more long-term approach to the relationship rather than the transactional kind that it's been for the past few years. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was wondering if you could comment on what you see Joe Biden's influence on U.S. foreign policy as far as Pakistan goes being, especially if Hillary Clinton becomes Secretary of State. My second question is, um, there are some in Pakistan who believe that Imran Khan of the Pakistan Tariq and Saf has the potential to be our Barack Obama. I was wondering if you could comment on Imran Khan's political future going forward. Well, very briefly on both these um, questions, I haven't read Joseph uh, Biden's uh, uh, article on Pakistan, so I can't comment on it. But now that you've pointed out to me that he's actually written one, I will read it uh, and comment on it somewhere uh, or the other. Uh, but it's not the case that U.S. relations with Pakistan have just been transactional. It's a relationship which goes quite deep and started in 1950. The interesting thing is, is that in the 50s, you had in the United States State Department and the CIA the possibility of different voices and different views being given. And that has more or less disappeared uh, over the last 30 years. But if you look in my book, when the one wing in the United States backed the military coup in 1958 in Pakistan, which set it on its present track, there was another research and development wing in the State Department which wrote an incredibly far-sighted and brilliant paper saying, if you guys go ahead and do this, these will be the consequences for that region and for Pakistan. And it's exactly the same as some of us, even though very young at the time, were saying inside Pakistan itself and were being denounced for being subversive and communist and all that. So, what the United States has lost over the last three decades, I would say, is this ability to have both arguments presented. That's extremely important. And let's hope that Obama reinstitutes that and just doesn't listen to one voice alone, because that is very dangerous. Uh, uh, and that is what the Bush and Cheney government uh, has been doing. As far as Imran Khan is concerned, that he's very different from Barack Obama. I mean, Barack Obama is an intellectual, really. He's a very intelligent guy, probably one of the most intelligent presidents the United States has elected for many, many years. Uh, so, you know, he reads, he knows uh, what, the, what the world is like, he's traveled in that world, and so this in itself marks a small step forward for humanity. But, <clears throat> uh, but the, 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 the and, and he's a consummate politician. Uh, 
you know, the guy is, his life is politics. It's not the case with Imran Khan in Pakistan, who's a very decent guy, incorruptible, but he's a sort of sporting star. And his basic instincts aren't so political. And so whether he could play the same role, I don't know. The guy who could play it, if he was so determined, is the former Chief Justice of the Supreme Court. I mean, they're not going to reinstate him. So he is the person who, if he did launch a new party, could unite the most decent sections of Pakistani society. Um, I just want to say, um, I like you. I mean, I, I, I didn't even know you before coming here, but I'm like, I'm listening to you and I'm thinking, um, I'll, would you come back to Wicker Park or something? I'll buy you coffee and I'll, I'll cook you Halim or something, because you're great. I mean, no, seriously. Um, okay, the one thing I wanted to say, just a comment and then like a question. Um, the three members of Congress, that, and I have not served in Congress, and I'm not a staffer for Congress, but that have called for the recognition of a Palestinian state, and there are three Lebanese Americans, are Nick Rahal of West Virginia, mm -hmm. um, former uh, Congressman uh, Ray LaHood of Illinois, and also um, Dan Issa of uh, California. They may not have, like, you know, yeah. been on BBC and said, you know, uh, okay, but they have called for it. So just, you know, whatever. Okay, my question is this. Um, I think everyone here agrees that um, nationalism, or rather, like uh, in, encouraging of nationalism within like a population like Iraq, is that the foreign presence of troops, the fact that they leave. As we look at Congo, we look at all these countries, even the UN. If troops go in, there's still kind of this animosity that they have, the local population, yeah, yeah, yeah. and how is that, how would that be reconciled? Because I, the U.S. there is, it, I've been, I was in, actually I was in Pakistan about three years ago, hmm. and um, I, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful country, but as you point out, it's, it's you know, yeah. it's incredibly, you know, division of class, and I'm just, I'm just curious, if, they, if, if these armies leave, and the U.N. doesn't have like this force, eventually the, the population is going to like it. What's the answer, like, like short-term and long-term, to reconcile that, I guess? Well, look, I mean, Iraq itself has a long history of amity and peace between Sunni and Shia. The conflicts are very, very recent in Iraqi history. If you look at the leadership even of the Ba'ath Party when it was formed in Iraq, it was largely dominated by people of Shia origin. So this religiosity, which has formed parties, largely started happening after Khomeini's victory in 1977. And the Iran-Iraq war, which most people think was instigated exclusively by Saddam, this is not totally accurate. I mean, Khomeini had a, 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 a religious fervor. I mean, he knew that the holy places of the Shias, Karbala and Najaf, were in Iraq. So there was a desire by the newly pumped up Iranian clerical regime to provoke a conflict with Iraq. And, you know, obviously both sides did it. But I don't think it's correct to underplay the Iranian responsibility. And they could have stopped it when a ceasefire was suggested to them. So I'm saying we have to bear this in mind, because what existed once with difficulties can finally be restored again. And it's always the same argument which we face. If we are there and we withdraw, there'll be chaos, to which I reply, but there's chaos now because you are there. <laughs> And so it's, it certainly won't be heaven or paradise after you leave, but at least people there will be forced to work with each other and work out a solution, hopefully with the help of sane neighboring countries. And I think that applies to Iraq and that applies to Afghanistan, and which is why I've argued with Afghanistan that the United States shouldn't make the same mistake they made earlier and hand it to Pakistan to police that it has to be a regional solution in Afghanistan, otherwise the mess will continue. And that must have Iran and Russia even involved in the peace uh, in that region. That's it. Yeah. Uh, thank you for speaking, Dr. Ali. Um, my question relates to uh, a topic that you brought up in the beginning of your speech. Um, in 2005, um, The Guardian um, released an article about Ariel Sharon the same year uh, that he pulled unilaterally out of the Gaza Strip, and it showed him essentially as a monster. 
Um, he had like fangs and there's blood dripping from his teeth and he was kind of like hulking and big. Would you, in your opinion, is that purely anti- is it purely anti-Zionist or does it have strains of anti-Semitism? In what, The Guardian? In The Guardian, yeah. It's certainly not anti-Semitic. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, The Guardian has on occasion very publicly criticized the Israeli regime because they have a team of journalists, two or three of whom are very sharp. Uh, And they have done it. It's honestly, you know, to accuse that paper of anti-Semitism would be crazy. I mean, they bend over backwards most of the time to appease uh, Israel. So I wouldn't regard that as uh, anti-Semitism at all. I mean, my criticism of The Guardian is that their reporting of the region is inconsistent. Occasionally they publish very good stuff, then they stop publishing it for a long, long time. And in order for a population to learn what's going on, you get the Israeli point of view non-stop on television and in the print media. Non-stop. And you have to be given the other side of the case. And when there's a suicide bombing carried out by Palestinians, it is never contextualized. The Israelis can contextualize it because they know what they've been doing. But... The people in the West just see it in isolation from what the situation in that part of the world is, and that is very dangerous. And I really think, I mean, look, there is anti-Semitism in the world. I don't deny that. But uh, it has nothing to do uh, with people who are you know, criticizing Israel for the atrocities it's carrying out in Palestine. Don't think that. So the strength of that pic- picture was only anti-Zionist? Sorry? And the strength of the picture? Uh, was anti-Zionist specifically. It was anti-Israeli policies, yeah. Oh, thank you. As you suggested that in, um, in Afghanistan, it should be the U.S., and I agree that the U.S. is seen as a foreign occupier just like Soviets were and the British were. But when when they leave, what happens then? I mean, do, do, do the – there's no institutions to speak of in Afghanistan. Do they – the Northern Alliance and the Taliban and all the different factions duke it out and whoever comes up comes up? What happens then? Well, no. I mean, this is what I've been saying, that <clears throat> the regional powers who have a big influence in that country, Pakistan, India, uh, Russia, Iran, have to be brought in and they have to guarantee that their supporters and people they work and collaborate are prepared to form a national government and the state of war in that country. And with, I mean, China and Russia, if they want to now, they economically, the Chinese are very strong, and they're on the borders of Afghanistan, could rebuild the country and give it an infra, social infrastructure. So I think the plan should be 10 years of peace in Afghanistan. Let's try peace out. Let's give it a chance. And the way to give it a chance is to have a national government. I'm not in favor of handing the country simply to the neo-Taliban. I mean, even though they're the ones who are fighting, there are other parts of the country, and there are other players in the country. So I think it would actually be even in the interests of the West to do that. Uh, and not hand it over to the Pakistanis because mistakes will be uh, repeated. And that, I think, if that is done, then, you know, it creates the basis for a stable exit strategy by NATO. As for, you know, the key thing is Hamid Karzai, who the West put in there. I mean, he won't be accepted by anyone. His brother is uh, the largest heroin smuggler in the country. Corruption by him and his cronies sort of has enveloped the southern parts of Afghanistan. You know, they made a lot of money, quite a lot of the money sent in by the West, they've pocketed and it's in foreign banks. That's the way they do it. And so I don't think that Hamid Karzai will be acceptable. Some of the people who work with him will be, but he he will have to be brought back and given a job here. Or, you know, he's very fond of clothes and Shoals, and so he could model shoals on the catwalks of Paris. <laughs> but you do believe that all the neighboring countries that they can actually come together, they've all suffered enough because they of have. I think the country has suffered enough, and people right. just are tired of war. You know, it's been a 30 year war. Just imagine the impact of any country having a war for 30 years. It's traumatic.
channels. And I have to say that the discussions that took place on Pakistani television in the first two or three years after the new channels came into being was freer, more diverse than anything happening in the West. There were big political debates. A journalist would challenge a general uh, or a retired general and say, you did A, B, and C when you carried out crimes. Why did you do it? The whole execution of Bhutto being publicly discussed. And initially, Musharraf didn't mind this at all. You know, he was quite proud that he'd done this till the judge, till he sacked the chief justice. And why did he sack the chief justice? He sacked the chief justice because the chief justice had ordered the release of disappeared prisoners who there was no proof against them at all. You know, I don't want to go into that. I've discussed it in my book at length. And when he sacked the chief justice, a real movement began, initially by lawyers in the middle classes, but then ordinary people joined in, poor people joined in. Because for the first time in their lives, they saw that there was someone at the top position in Pakistan, head of the Supreme Court, who was interested in them and their welfare. So they supported the movement, and the movement was covered non-stop on the independent television channels, which built it up, built it up, and that's when he struck by declaring the state of emergency and imposing censorship, and one of the channels, Geo, just went off the air. And they're back on again, but under some restrictions uh, and, uh, and, and, and pressure. So though that has been an important development in Pakistan, without any doubt. There's a view that Pakistan would like to have an unstable Afghanistan and, a, and that area to have a uh, sort of ha as a counterweight to India, to have armed uh, batons that they can threaten India with on occasions. Is that a serious view? Or if this is, then is there a way of getting around that issue? Well, it used to be a serious view held by strategists within the Pakistani military, who used to say, we need Afghanistan to give ourselves strategic depth, uh, and that will strengthen us in relation to India. And it hasn't worked, the strategic depth. I mean, the clashes in Kargil, uh, the war which the Pakistani military provoked against India finally ended badly for them and isolated them. And there's no way they can defeat India. And there is no way uh, it's, you know, I mean, it's dangerous even to attempt it because they're both countries and are nuclear states. So I don't think they're going to fight any more wars. So instead of achieving strategic depth to try and uh, defeat India, they should you know, withdraw from all these foolish conceptions and try and rebuild the country, which is, as I've explained, in a dire state. And they know it is in a dire state. Um, so I don't think they're going to go in for that. They're going to go in for that. Again, the Kashmir issue between India and Pakistan remains unresolved. But recently, Sardari denounced the Kashmiris who are fighting the Indian army as terrorists, clearly to uh, appease his new friends. And for the first time, Kashmiris burnt, his eff uh, burnt the effigies of a Pakistani leader in Baramulla. That is another first Sardari has achieved for the country. Uh, but the, 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 the problem is, you know, the. the in, I, um, I have argued that what the region needs to do, South Asia, is move towards a South Asian Union, which doesn't challenge the sovereignty of any country, but creates a new structure within which Kashmir and the Tamil question in Sri Lanka can be sorted out. That there is, in other words, you have to move away from military conflict and in a new direction if you are the least bit interested, even in your own security. And I think that will come one day, but not from this set of politicians in either India or Pakistan. I think it will come. Can we make these the last two? Because I can't carry on all night. I'm sorry. I'd love to, but I'm... Yes, and, and the more you carry on, the more questions we have. I know. It's terrible. Uh, one thing I was wondering, and it was brought up by what you said after, I mean, during the question session, um, how do we put 10 years of peace in Islamic terms. Can we talk about Hudna or what? 10 years of peace? You were speaking, you know, what they need is, of course, 
yeah. uh, cooperation from the surrounding states and uh, 10 years of peace to rebuild at least. And, I, and I'm asking, you know, what do we back this up with in terms of, in fact, the uh, Quran uh, interested people there who, who are rather as theocratic as people who think the invisible hand of the market solves all our problems? Well, some are and some aren't. I mean, you know, it's not the case that every Afghan supported the old style Taliban. They didn't do it. Lots of them hated it, in fact. And this is why my suggestion that you need the regional powers and their supporters in this country involved is critically important. Because if that happens and you create a national government, and the national government knows that the no stupidity is going to be tolerated because we have India, Pakistan, Russia, Iran watching us and monitoring uh, the peace, I think it could work. I think the Afghans would be ready for it. Yeah. Earlier you mentioned um, China uh, could potentially rebuild Afghanistan very quickly. Um, have they been involved in um, Afghanistan at all economically um, since the United States invasion in 2001? Yeah, I think that the regional countries, and it's in China's interests, I mean the <clears throat> current Secretary General of NATO has made some very foolish statements. I mean, he's not a very intelligent guy, sort of wooden-headed Dutchman called Jube Sheffer, who's basically said that the reason we are in Afghanistan and will build bases in perpetuity is because Afghanistan is located on the borders with China. I mean, even if you believe that, to say it, which means, you know, the, but the Chinese may not speak up publicly, but don't imagine that they don't notice what's going on. And they've made it very clear uh, to the Pakistani military that they're not going to tolerate per basis in perpetuity and an exit strategy has to be worked out and no doubt the United States is fully aware of that. So, I mean, I think if the Chinese were told this is the way we're going to have an exit strategy and this is what you have to do economically, it could happen. It, it does require a bold initiative and it could happen and that would be the best thing for the people of Afghanistan. And is there any investment now? What? Any investment now from China into Afghanistan? No. Okay. Thank you. Okay. The World Beyond the Headlines Lecture Series is a collaborative project of the University of Chicago Center for International Studies and the International House Global Voices Program. The World Beyond the Headlines series aims to bring scholars and journalists together to consider international news stories and how these stories are covered. As a listener, you have come to rely on this program for in-depth analysis of major issues facing our country and our world. But we can only continue our nationally recognized coverage with support from you. Secure the future of World Beyond the Headlines programming by making your gift online at alumniservices.uchicago.edu slash giving. Please specify World Beyond the Headlines as the area of giving. The World Beyond the Headlines series is supported by the McCormick Foundation, the Norman Wade Harris Fund, and from generous contributions from listeners like you.